Awful Sports presents. Welcome to Awful Sports presentation in conjunction with the Underground Scholars Eddie the Terminator Markin, part one of a three part series. Included in this series is a never before seen picture of Eddie on YouTube and a new look at Eddie's so called schizophrenia, plus some key video of fights in his career. Get your popcorn or whatever strikes your fancy and enjoy part one, Eddie Marken, 60s Heavyweight Terminator. The Dennis Moore. The origin of Eddie Markin's first fighting vocation was his love of Sugar Ray and Joe Lewis. His father Norman struggled to support his stay-at-home wife and six children with Eddie being the Markin in the middle. They got by on his dad's rural letter carrier salary in Redding, California. In stately Redding, California, one of the things they were most proud of was the Shasta Union Dam. And Shasta was also the name of Eddie Mockin's high school. Shasta Union High School. And the name they competed under in sports was the Shasta Union Wolves. At Shasta, Eddie made a name for himself being the starting fullback on the varsity football team as a sophomore. Eddie was also on the varsity basketball team, but not as a starter. Eddie was not on the football team his junior year, but was on the varsity basketball team again, but not as a starter. Eddie was connected to high school, like Peter Gibbons of Office Space was connected to work. Eddie tried to imitate his boxing heroes in his own way. He abandoned his job selling newspapers and his job as a pin boy at the bowling alley and dropped out of school. Next, Eddie was getting into fist fights with people, just like Bruce Lee did in his childhood in the streets of Hong Kong. Dave Mills. Dave Mills was his first formal trainer and manager and also his uncle. Uncle Dave was a pro boxer whose record was six wins, eight losses, eight draws, and four KOs. At first, his record looked pedestrian, but was not once you saw the quality of his opponents. He had two no decisions against Harry Wills and young Peter Jackson, as well as a TKO loss to Frank Moran, as well as a second round TKO loss to Sam Langford. Langford was defending his world colored heavyweight title. Please keep in mind this was right after. World War One. Uncle Dave would be crowned in 1919 as the inaugural South American heavyweight champion, winning a 15-round tough decision against Luis Ferpo, who would win the South American championship from and defend it successfully against Dave Mills. Both 
first round KOs, squash matches, by the wild bull of the pompous, Luis Firpo, bringing the curtain down on Uncle Dave's boxing days. Three fights and a fallout with Uncle Dave turned into an aborted amateur career. Eddie explains it this way. When I was younger, I got in bad. I got in with some bad people. There was a ring of, no pun intended, we had a ring of people. We had a big silver barrel gun, and people remembered it, and we got caught. Markin and his failed gang got caught seven times. Eddie went to the big house. Though he claimed he went in as a kid and came out as a grown-up, sadly Eddie would lose three years of his life being sentenced to Soledad Prison in California, which just opened in December 3rd, 1951. Soledad was a former internment camp during World War II from 1944 to 1946. German POW workers worked to fulfill agricultural labor camp needs. In Eddie's time, Soledad was rebuilt and reconfigured for the overflow from San Quentin Prison. One of Eddie's future alumni was boxer-actor Dan Triejo in 1968. After three years, Eddie was released in 1955. Markin was free again, but Eddie seemed at a loss for direction and identity after regaining his freedom. Eddie then became a kind of lumberjack and delivering mail for Uncle Sam like his dad. Lee Hughes, a local boxing instructor, entered the picture to, to give guidance to Eddie, who was gaining strength physically but mentally, he was a rudderless ship without a port to go to. Hughes lit the candle of Eddie's dream of price fighting for real. Markin made it count. He made his first ten opponents act like bowling pins on a strike. He knocked out his first ten. His home ring was the Cow Palace of San Francisco. Most of his first wins were of no reputation except Howard Honeyboy King, who was a good test, and a future trail horse. After the 10th KO, an important thing would happen with Eddie in the San Francisco area. Sid Flaherty, a well-connected promoter in the area, made Eddie one of his stable. Markin had two more decision wins, and then a major decision win against Nino Valdez of Cuba at Eddie's stomping grounds in the Cow Palace. Eddie had a TKO win after that against FSC Matt Jackson. Then a KO win, knocking out Nino Valdez in his backyard of Miami for a second win and an exclamation point. Eddie rocketed upward, reeling off another three straight wins. A point win over a crusty Johnny Summerlin. the jawbreaker of Eddie Markin's rival, Zora Foley. Eddie then beat the wily but in decline Joey Maxim in two straight bouts. Markin would finish strong in 1957 by climbing to the top of the world heavyweight rankings. T-Jack, i.e. Tommy Hurricane Jackson, who was slapped back down the ladder in a return match with defending champion Fast Floyd Patterson. Eddie started fast against Jackson, knocking him down in round one. And then twice again in the tenth, which caused Jackson to go into the forced gump mode and stay on his stool in the eleventh round for a TKO for Team Machen. Eddie was now 24-0, and only Zor Foley was standing in his way. Eddie was muddled into a snooze a match, a draw with Zor Foley, 
but he still could claim undefeated status. Just a bad day at the office, as handlers thought. Next was Olympic silver medalist and wielder of what was called Thor's Hammer, Ingo's Bingo, i.e. a booming right hand that's sneaky hard. At 20-0 and 12 KOs, Igamar Johansson was in the frozen tundra of Switzerland in his hometown backyard. Eddie brought in his 24-0-1 record with 16 KOs. Most pundits had chosen Eddie, who seemed to have the better quality wins. Here we are, the Ingemar Johansson Eddie Machen fight on September 14, 1958. Eddie's walking out to get weighed. Uh, this gentleman is the promoter, Machen, and he's going to come in at 194 and a half. Johansson, 198.25. Here we are, this capacity crowd in Switzerland, as Eddie Machen enters the ring. This Uleve Stadium, located in Gothenburg, Sweden, is a brand new arena. This arena opened up on June 8th through June 29th for the FIFA World Cup. Machen appears warmed up Contrary to reports saying Eddie was cold coming into the first round. No pun intended. Johansson is entering the ring. The winner is rumored to be fighting Patterson in June 26, 1959 at Yankee Stadium. In Sweden, they check the boxing gloves with four officials before they give them to the fighters before the opening bell rings. Two months ago, on July 13th, Johansson knocked out Heinz Nyhaus in the fourth round in this very arena. Eddie just fought 12 rounds with Zora Foley two weeks ago, raising concerns on fighting such a big fight with so little rest and preparation. Johansson appears extremely ho-ho, but there is a condition for Patterson to fight the winner of this fight. He must first get past Brian London in May in Indiana. As we start out, it looks like the typical feeling out process. Ingo's biggest fight was about two fights ago against Henry Cooper of England when he defended his European title with a fifth round knockout. Eddie's two biggest victories were against Nino Valdes, once via KO and once via decision. Ingo still jabbing and moving. Eddie getting in occasionally, but Ingo's already moving. Oh, a good right hand there by Eddie. Sends Ingo back a little bit. Didn't quite connect all the way as the two intensify the action with Ingo still jabbing and running. And there's a hold right there as the referee walks away for no apparent reason. Eddie trying to close the gap, putting a little bit more pressure. Ingo trying to get out of the corner. Right now, just Eddie's just kind of still milling about. Eddie just kind of hanging out and then PANG! Right on the button! Eddie crashes to the canvas as the referee counts. Eddie somehow gets up from that blow, goes off to the side, and the referee allows them to continue. Eddie tries to hold on, Rabbit punches a little bit, and then the referee decides to maybe join the fracas. Well, he backs off again. Wait a minute. Here he comes. He finally lets them get separated. Ingo does have a sense of urgency, but he's not throwing caution to the wind as Eddie holds on. And the referee lingers behind, then decides to do his job. There are a lot of camera flashes going on, and Eddie appears to be out on his feet, and PANG! It appeared to be a right uppercut and a left hook that sent Eddie sprawling to the canvas. Eddie somehow struggles to get up as Ingo moves in for the kill. He's pummeling with everything you think of and he falls down, but the referee again is nowhere to be found. And as Eddie is punched about 20 times needlessly, the referee stops and starts to actually count. Eddie will not get up from this, and the referee is solely to blame for this 
fight being out of control. Eddie took about 20 punches that he shouldn't have. The referee should have got in there earlier, should have been closer to the action. And Eddie was actually at one point like a catcher with his weight supporting him to keep him from falling onto the ground. And then Eddie somehow got um, hold of himself and tried to get up, but the referee should have been in there by then. And instead, Eddie takes 20 unnecessary punches, falls to the ground, and is counted out by the very suspect referee. I think the underground scholars may have a good case here for the validity of this match that we have just witnessed. For Eddie, it looks like a suspect match, but definitely a step backward for him as he will have to regroup as Ingo will most likely get that shot at Floyd Patterson in June. Some insiders at the time seem to have felt that Eddie, through this fight, in order to get a shot later, and Diamato wanted a match with Johansson first because they felt that there was more money to be made fighting Ingo because he was a medalist in the Olympics and there was an overseas aspect to it to get more foreign money into, say, a close circuit match to make it more of a world interest than strictly an American interest. So um, the ducks are on the water and with the, with the underworld figures that were prevalent at that time, it is a distinct possibility, but this is the scholar's opinion alone. Don't miss the next episode of Eddie the Terminator Marken, Part 2, Quest for Patterson. In Part 2, Eddie arises from the ashes, forces a showdown with Godzilla himself, Sonny Liston. We will show the footage and have a fight commentary as well as analysis of what happened after the disastrous Igamar Johansson fight. So please subscribe, click, and leave a comment. Special thanks to all of you from us at Awful Sports, Dennis Moore, and the Underground Scholars. See you soon.